good morning. It's really an honor to be here and, and provide some remarks on behalf of OASH and uh, the Assistant Secretary. So welcome to the 58th meeting of the Advisory Committee on Blood and Tissue Safety and Availability. Uh, thank you all for the committee members for being here virtually and for devoting your time and expertise to this important committee. And it's wonderful to be having this, this meeting during this month uh, because it's National Blood Donor Month. And I'd like to honor our blood donors and those who work in the field for their help. In December, on December 31st, 1969, President Richard Nickerson proclaimed January as National Blood Donor Month to honor and thank voluntary blood donors for their generosity and encourage new blood donors to give blood. And this month also serves as a reminder of the importance of blood donations and the impact they have on saving lives. As you know, every two seconds, someone in the United States needs blood, whether it's for surgery, cancer treatment, childbirth, a serious injury, a blood disorder, or other needs. And blood donations are essential as there's no substitute for blood and it plays such a critical role in helping people during their time of need. I wanna personally thank you all. My family uh, has benefited from blood donations this year. And it's just tremendously amazing to see individuals voluntarily give blood to help those in need. This year's theme is celebrating diversity, inclusive, inclusivity and equity in blood donation. While all Americans are encouraged to donate blood, it is especially important for people of diverse backgrounds to donate to create a robust blood supply. It is critical to ensure that individuals with rare blood types and patients with conditions like sickle cell disease have compatible and closely matched blood available when they need it. And last year, one of our, uh, a proud moment for me to be here at this time, the FDA issued new blood donation eligibility guidance. That was landmark achievement for the blood community and the nation. All prospective blood donors may now be asked a series of individual risk-based questions to determine their eligibility, regardless of their sexual orientation, sex, gender. And this update and guidance is a major step towards a more inclusive blood donation process. Admiral Rachel Levine, my boss, recently wrote a blog post commending the FDA for their hard work and offering her gratitude to the blood donors. And I certainly second that sentiment. And I know many of you on this, this call uh, contributed to that landmark um, uh, policy change. A strong and consistent supply of blood and plasma is critical to the health of our nation as clearly donations save lives. Now to pivot to the critical work before you all today, uh, last July, this committee met to open the critical conversation of strengthening our nation's blood surge capacity and explore ways to address supply chain issues and long-term challenges. I know that in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the blood industry faced immense challenges in securing supplies due to unpredictable supply change, chains. And there were also new challenges in recruiting donors and contending with fundamental shifts in donor behavior and routines. As Jim shared, I was at the Pennsylvania Department of Health during the, the front side of the pandemic. And, and I myself had the opportunity to work with our Pennsylvania donor community uh, to navigate through those challenging times. Those issues that you are working hard to solve can have profound implications on patients who rely on blood and blood components for treatment and for individuals who need blood at any point of time. And it's also imperative that we have the ability to respond effectively to unexpected emergencies or disasters to save lives. So today you will continue the discussions that you began last summer's meeting and deliberate on proactive approaches to ensure that we have the capacity to meet the demands for life-saving blood and blood products at times when they are promptly needed. As, as Admiral Levine is the blood safety officer and the chair of the blood organ and tissue senior executive council here at the Department of Health, she is committed to working with you to address these challenges and bolster our nature's surge capacity. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts on this important and, and unfortunately extremely timely issue. I now um, am very excited uh, to take a moment and welcome a few new members 
to our advisory committee on blood safe uh, advisory committee on blood and tissue safety and availability and to partake in the essential conversations both being had today and in the future. And so without further ado, it's my honor to swear in the following three new members of the committee. Dr. Srecha Pandey from Stanford University School of Medicine and Stanford Blood Center. Mr. Joshua Penrod from Plasma Protein Fraction Community. And Ms. Stacy Syme, a major blood supplier. New members, please join me. And if you want to raise your right hand and repeat after me. Hi. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Excellent. Welcome. All right, here we go. So right hand raised. Uh, I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. I do swear. solemnly swear. swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support, I will support and defend the Constitution, and the Constitution of the United States. United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against, against all enemies, enemies foreign, foreign and domestic. domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear that true, will bear faith, true and faith and allegiance to the same. same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this, that I take this obligation, obligation freely. freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any, Without mental, any mental, mental reservation, reservation or purpose, purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Of the office of which I am about to enter. Of the office of, the of, office of which, which I'm, I'm about, about to enter. enter. So help me God. So help, so help me God. God. Excellent. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And I, I really, again, I want to thank all of you for being here today and taking time and energy to share your knowledge and expertise. I know Admiral Levine is very much looking forward to receiving your thoughtful recommendations to increase the surge capacity for blood and blood products in the United States. And I'll send it back over to you, Jim. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah, for those wonderful opening remarks and welcoming our three new members to the Advisory Committee on Blood and Tissue Safety and Availability. With that, before I turn it over to the chairs, I wanna do uh, the requirements for a roll call to ensure that we do have a quorum. So with that, I'll start out with the special government employees. And if you're present, just indicate that you're present. Start out with Claudia Cohn. Here. Diane Wilson. Here. Ray Goodrich. Present. Elisa Gordon. Present. Jed Gorlin. Present. Cassandra Josephson. Present. Michelle Kamika. Michelle Kamika. Moving on to Paul Pre Ness. Present. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. I couldn't find the unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. Paul Ness. Present. Suchi Pandey. Present. Moving on to our representative members, Lou Barnes. Present. Susan Galil. Present. Benny Yang. Present. Josh Penrod. Present. Glenn Ramsey. Present. Eric Santiago Justiano. Present. Stacy Syme. Present. Lynn Yule. Present. Moving on to our ex officio members. Sridhar Basarajavu. Sridhar, if you're, I thought you, you were on, you might be on mute. I'm present, present. Thanks, Sridhar. Scott Brubaker. Present, Jim. Diane Corning. Diane had indicated she might be late and would be dialing in later. Moving on to Ann Etter. Present. Thank you. I'd like to also point out that Ann Etter is the new FDA blood um, ex officio member replacing um, Nicole Verdun as the FDA ex officio member. Next, Marilyn Levy. 
Marilyn, Present. you might be on mute. Present. Thanks, Marilyn. David Strontzek. Present. Great. Okay, with that, I'm gonna, we do have a quorum. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to the chairs to start the uh, Advisory Committee in Blood and Tissue Safety and Availability meeting. Thank you, Jim. Um, on behalf of Diane and I, um, our, Diane Wilson, the co-chair, I'd like to welcome the new members to the ACBTSA and welcome back all of the old members. Thanks to everyone for taking the time um, out of your busy schedules to be part of the 58th meeting of the ACBTSA. We have a busy schedule. Um, we're going to begin with discussions around skin allograft procurement. We'll have two presentations on that topic. The first one will be Franco Avo talking about BARDA's skin allograft procurement and vendor management inventory. And the second will be from Sharon Smith, who will just tell us about skin allograft vendor managed inventory at Solvita. This will be followed by a short break, and then we will hear from Martin Grable and John Mass, who will tell us about Circulate LLC, a collaborative blood intelligence, which is um, part of the response to the ACBTSA's report to Congress in which we recommended that uh, the data infrastructure for blood needed to be strengthened. And the, um, as far as I understand, Circulate is data in near real time that represents blood from the collection side of the industry, um, about 60% of, um, of the blood collected in the United States. Um, after we hear from Martin and John, we'll take a lunch break and then move on to recommendations. The recommendations today, we have 10 of them to address. We first saw all of these in the 57th meeting of the ACBTSA and have had time um, via email to discuss these and um, hone them and receive comments from the community. Um, I also would like to note that Admiral Levine and her staff and Jim met with the White House in early December to um, discuss uh, blood organ and tissue roles within OASH. Um, they met with the deputy assistant to the president and direct, director of the Office of Pandemic Preparedness and Response Policy, Major General Paul Friedrichs. And it's um, encouraging to me to hear that the White House has taken an interest in uh, the surge capacity for blood. And it is clear from notes that Jim shared from the meeting that there is a very good discussion and a lot of good questions were asked that I hope um, some of those questions will be answered by the recommendations today. So with that, I'd like to move on to the first presentation, um, Barda Skin Allograft Procurement and Vendor Managed Inventory by Franco Avu, Avu from the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response or ASPR. Franco? <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you very much for having me today and Happy New Year. Um, I'm Franco Avo. I'm a project officer and contracting officer's representative um, in, at the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Um, and let me just pull up my slides here. Actually, Mike, I'm sorry, can you actually show your slides and I'll run it from your end? I think I misunderstood. Thank you, thank you. Great. Perfect. So for all of those that don't know um, ASPR, it is the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, and it serves as the lead federal health agency responsible for helping communities prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters and emergencies affecting our nation's health care systems. We accomplish this in several ways, including developing, stockpiling, and distributing response tools against multiple threats, sending clinical response teams to places in times of crisis, and ensuring our healthcare and public health partners have the knowledge and tools they need to navigate today's healthcare security threats. The work at ASPR does not, the, sorry, the work at ASPR does, um, is important more than ever today to keep us 
with the evolving threat landscape, ASPR must remain nimble and ever vigilant. This presentation lays out one specific way that ASPR's strategic goals and programs will help the countries prepare the country prepare for, respond to, and recover from a mass casualty incident where burns are a severe medical consequence. Within the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority was established and mandated by Congress as an organization within the US government to catalyze innovation and advanced research and development manufacture and procure of medical countermeasures or MCMs. These life-saving MCMs are needed to protect people during public health emergencies from threats such as chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear or sea burn incidents, whether accidental or intentional. Pandemic influenza, COVID-19, and other emerging infectious diseases are also included. BARDA works closely with interagency partners through the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasure Enterprise, or FEMSI, to ensure a coordinated whole of government approach to medical countermeasure preparedness and response. The BARDA model has proven successful in leveraging public-private partnerships to accelerate development of medical countermeasures that are vital to national security. BARDA helps its partners promote innovation and develop countermeasures from early research through FDA licensure and clinical application. We do this with flexible, nimble authorities, multi-year funding, cutting edge expertise, facilitating partnerships, and by promoting innovation. So the work that ASPR does is more important, sorry. <laughs> uh, so as I've, as I've said, um, BARDA is the lead office within HHS for Advancing Research and Development, or ARND, as well as procurement of medical countermeasures to protect the American civilian population from seaburn threats. Ultimately, these medical countermeasures are used to help nation, the nation prepare for and respond to public health emergencies arising from national, natural occurring or intentional engineering threats, engineered threats. The biological, radiological and nuclear division within BARDA uses the advanced research and development authorities to help innovation, innovators develop uh, promising candidate medical countermeasures for preclinical development to clinical trials and manufacturing to scale, to scale up to FDA approvals. The Seaburn Division leverages its Project BioShield authorities with, to procure approved or approvable MCMs to save lives and protect Americans from 21st century health security threats. So it's, it's really important to understand the distinction between AR and D where we fund advanced research and development and Project BioShield where we actually do the procurement. The Chemical, Biological, and Radiological and Nuclear Division achieves its mission by developing capabilities to rapidly mitigate known and unknown threats, invest in sustainable medical countermeasure development, production, and administration to protect all populations comprehensively and equitably. So, like most good governmental departments, it might seem like we're, we are a nice set of nesting dolls. Within the Sea Burn Division, you will find my program, the Burn and Blast Program. Uh, we receive our mission requirements from the nuclear space and the medical consequences that are likely during that catastrophe. The benefits to work, sorry, the benefits to the work we do in the Burn and Blast Program has applicability to other natural disasters where burns may be prevalent. Therefore, our goal is to build a comprehensive portfolio of MCMs that contribute to preparedness in a man-made and natural disaster by being, able to, by being able to treat a range of burn and blast trauma injuries to improve health outcomes. And our, our strategy is very straightforward to address routine everyday issues in definitive care with adoptable and sustainable solutions that are usable and available. Addressing bottlenecks and resource challenges in everyday routine care by default helps us prepare for resource constrained environments in a mass casualty. Improved products that are easier to use or cut down on operation time and routine care 
are going to have the same impact when there are multiple patients waiting for treatment in an emergency. However, sometimes we need to have a safety net of traditional products that can be available when we, while we develop next generation life-saving products, as in the case with our procurement, procurement of human skin allograft. So at a very high level, I wanted to share and talk about BARDA's project BioShield procurement of human skin allograft and the preparedness level it provides the US government and the American public. Our requirement is to have enough skin to treat five, at least 5,000 people with a burden of approximately 40% TBSA. Our modeling calculates for moderate and severe burn victims. And I wanna note that the initial investment of $38 million does not cover the total amount of skin allograft needed to fill this requirement. The familiarity and use nationally and internationally of skin allograft and the affordability makes skin allograft a great option in a mass casualty. The product, the product development at HHS and under Project BioShield must account for the whole civilian population. And skin allograft allows us to care for pediatric, obstetric, and geriatric populations in an emergency. Having a large supply of skin allograft on hand, ready to be used when a mass casualty happens is key in a, res in, in a response and contributes to our preparedness as a country. Available, available, um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, next slide. So in order for us to have a large supply of skin, um, we had to understand the supply chain and the risks associated with tissue donation, recovery, processing, storage, and inevitably use. So during our market research, we explored the various risks and how these risks can contribute to shortages. From donors, the inventory can only be as robust as the donors who, can, who care to donate. Um, and even those willing don't always meet eligibility criteria. OPOs may not get to an eligible donor in time. Skin needs to be recovered within 24 hours of death and OPOs might have, the, the OPOs that have first rights may not always recover skin. And tissue banks don't always have relationships with the OPOs recovery, recovering skin. And although donors might meet eligibility criteria, um, they, may, they may not pass other medical tests and clearances. Additionally, the shelf life of this donated resource is infinite. Most units of skin allograft have a maximum shelf life of five years under cold chain storage, which further complicates storage logistics and longevity. Finally, skin allograft is a temporary cover and often requires multiple applications. And uh, grafts are manipulated on site to suit a surgeon and patient's need, sometimes resulting in waste. All of these risks while windle down the supply of this critical resource. All of these factors contributed to our decision to build a preparedness inventory and to not rely on a supply chain as an on-demand supply source. So as we started to understand the supply chain and tissue banking, we knew that any procurement had to include multiple tissue banks to mitigate risks of relying too heavily on one supplier. Additionally, there were some key principles we wanted to abide by. One, don't disturb the market. <laughs> we wanted to maintain the balance of supply and demand. And this was to also honor the gift of donation, but also to not give one tissue bank market dominance inadvertently. And two, operate within the tissue bank's existing capacity and capability. Uh, it was important for VARDA's vendor managed inventory to be a sustainable, sustainable percentage of the tissue bank's annual surplus. Additionally, we wanted the rotation or the management of the VMI to be on a first bait first in, first out product rotation to limit waste. And because BARDA sought to procure a large amount of skin allograft, it was important for us to understand the annual surplus of skin and purchase that from tissue banks over creating a bubble or a surge in production of skin specifically made for BARDA. So the skin that BARDA has purchased is the same skin that is available to any burn center or medical facility. 
Um, however, also having two partners to fulfill or our preparedness goals not only provides market diversity and security in the supply chain, but provides value to the government. Uh, for example, we are able to take advantage of relationships or partnerships um, having that those tissue banks have with organ procurement organizations, creating redundancy in our ability to source skin. It also allows us from the most strategic storage locations, so we're not putting all the eggs in one basket. We can leverage existing trusted partnerships or relationships between the tissue banks and their already commercial clients in the burn centers. So in the last slide, you heard me mention vendor managed inventory, and I'd like to explain a little more about it. There are two ways BARTA procures products, a traditional procurement in partnership with the SNS and vendor managed and a vendor managed inventory or a VMI as we usually say. <clears throat> Nearly all of our burn products have been procured through a VMI due to the particular needs of burn care and the limitations of stockpiling. Stockpiling is typically the method used when there is limited or no commercial use for the product. The cost to store and maintain is high, and when the product requires a mass shipment, deployment strategy and partnerships with state and locals, state and local authorities is necessary. So, whereas in a VMI, uh, like with our burn products, there is a commercial use which limits loss due to expiry, and the vendor is responsible for deployment and end user education and training. Another advantage of this method is the scalability of the inventory due to constant warm base being kept. So it's only always available and it's rotating in a commercial market already. So this is a, a very high level example of how a VMI is deployed in a mass casualty incident. During normal operations, you can see that the vendor manufactures the product, which they maintain and circulate out through commercial sales as particular lots near their expiry. This continues unless a mass casualty occurs and as per directive is sent to the vendor to prepare for deployment. The product is packaged and shipped where required, which is the case for our products and is directly sent to the burn centers in need. So to recap and conclude everything you've learned about this critical procurement of skin allograph, skin allograph remains one of the most widely used burn MCMs. Um, however, we also found that the supply chain for skin allograph is variable and not as reliable as traditional manufactured products since skin allograph produced are donated. And even when a donor is recovered, there are still medical clearances and donors must get through this um, they, they must get through this and it can take anywhere from three months to a year. Since skin allograft is widely used, affordable and effective, BARTA awarded two contracts to two different tissue banks to build a robust inventory of skin allograft. A vendor managed inventory was key in determining the best way to manage this resource. Firstly, it allows the tissue banks to do what they do best, manage a sustainable rotation while maintaining their existing relationships with burn centers. Secondly, we honor the donation by reducing any waste that might result in a traditional stockpile. Finally, since the product is stored and distributed when needed by the vendor, and since the vendor has direct relationships with burn centers through routine distribution, the infrastructure is already available in an emergency. This readily available resource provides BARDA with a critical preparedness safety net while develop and the while development and research is an ongoing for next generation burn products. So with that, I thank you for your time and uh, the final links for anyone interested in learning more about BARDA. Well, thank you, Franco. Um, that was that was interesting. Uh, we are a wee bit ahead of schedule, and there's time for some questions. If anyone in the audience would like to raise their hand, anyone on the panel, rather.
If there, there are no questions, then Scott um, has a question. Scott, sorry, thank you, thank you. go ahead, please. Yes, hi, Franco. Thank you for a great presentation. It's nice to see what's been happening, developing uh, the past couple of years. Can you um, tell us if there's been any discussion at all about using amniotic membrane to treat burns? I know in the United States, it's not really common for surgeons to use amniotic membrane for treating burns, but was there any um, discussion about that type of tissue? Yeah, during our market research, we, we explored um, all different types of alternative skin substitutes being uh, either it be allograft or xenograft or um, or even synthetic. Just it, I think what it came down to was one availability, um, cost, and then also people's I, burn surgeons or um, burn centers familiarity with the actual product itself. Um, we polled several uh, ABA um, members, American Burn Association members. Um, and burn centers or burn surgeons and found that the numbers of use for skin allograft were well beyond any other skin substitute. Um, in our ongoing market research, we still look at um, other alternatives, but we're finding that um, for whatever reason, <laughs> and it, it might be just the way surgeons are taught, uh, skin allograft seems to be the go-to for um, a lot of the centers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, I had a question. Thanks so much for that um, presentation. That was really interesting about a topic I don't know too much about, so that was really nice. Uh, great to hear that. Um, the work you're doing. So one question that I had was you had mentioned in one of the slides that the two partners will incrementally increase the surplus to meet the requirement. And so I wanted to just ask, you know, so what is your thoughts on how long that would take to reach your goal um, for that requirement? Yes, yeah, so um, the, the contracts that we have with both partners is five years at a base level. It's taken roughly a year now to get to three fourths of that 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 amount. Um, and, and that is an amount that we've, I guess, let me back up. So the, the contract is essentially separated into thirds. So we're only looking for a third of the requirement to be fulfilled at the moment, which isn't that 5,000 mark, but we will, there are options within the contract to then get us to that complete requirement of treating 5,000 people with X amount of square centimeters of skin allograft. Um, so as of now, uh, it's taken the partners probably a year to get three fourths um, of that requirement, that third requirement um, complete. And the way we've planned it out, because there is a five-year expiry on the, the, the product, um, we see it as kind of an increase, like a pyramid, and then it slowly decreases in order to like alleviate the bubble. And in case there's any, um, uh, I guess, let, let's say that there's an ex the, the period of performance for the contract is over after 10 years, um, we don't want the tissue banks to be left with a huge surplus of skin that they can't get rid of, and then it goes to waste. So we're allowing them to do a sustainable kind of drawdown of the product and circulate it back into the commercial, um, their, their commercial sales, and then that way they can use that instead of having to go and produce more but it really is based on their surplus. So the surplus is already there. We're just buying it from them. Um, but yeah, and it, I would say in total, it's taken two years to get a third of that requirement. Um, if that makes, if that answers your question. And then when we exercise another option, it would take another year to, to receive that two thirds of that requirement. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, we have time for one more short question, if there is one. Hi, this is Stacey Simfranco. Very interesting. I must have missed it, but how did you decide that 5,000 was your target? Because that seems small in comparison. So I'm just very interested how you did that analysis. Yeah, so we uh, our requirements is our requirements are based on a uh, scenario based analysis um, for a nuclear detonation, and those numbers come from a nuclear detonation happening. Um, and it depends on how big the detonation is, and I I don't know how much I can share up that information, but that that number comes from um, severe and moderate burn victims within a certain radius of the explosion, obviously some people will not survive, but those people that will survive, um, the calculation, and granted the the number 5,000 is an approximate number. I think it is a little higher than that, but not much. But um, it is from a scenario-based analysis based on a nuclear detonation, and it is the most severe uh, moderate cases of burns where approximately and I, I anticipate that it would be 40% to 70%. Anything over 70% would be a really difficult um, patient to treat in a mass casualty incident. But um, anything that's under, say, 30%, they might have enough skin just for autografting, and therefore allograft may not be used. So it does seem like a small number in the scheme of things, but I think it really has to do with survivorship within a sure. nuclear detonation. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Well, thank you again. Um, thanks for the questions. Thank you for a great presentation, Franco. Um, it's time to move on now to our next presentation by Sharon Smith from Solvita VMI. Uh, she will talk today about skin allograft vendor managed inventory at Solvita. Sharon? Hi there, hopefully you guys can see me and hear me okay. Yes? Yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. And are you gonna be showing my slides then or should I share my screen? Perfect, awesome, we'll jump on in. Great, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it, happy new year. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to thank Franco, who just gave an excellent presentation. Um, I have the privilege of working with him um, every week, if not multiple times a week. He is our contracting officer representative, uh, truly great guy, very professional. So thank you, Franco. Uh, for the for the lead in. Uh, Franco did a great job explaining the what, the why, the who, and the when. And I'm going to dive a little deeper on the how. How a tissue bank manages such a vast stockpile while ensuring that we have adequate supply of uh, skin for our local and our international needs. My name is Sharon Smith. I've been with Solvita for about two years now, um, and I'm, I'm really happy to be there. So next slide, please. I'll just share with you a quick agenda. I'm gonna give some disclosures, share with you our mission and vision, talk about how we recover the skin and process the skin, the quality that's entailed with that, some production considerations, a little background also Vita in a crisis or in crisis situations, and then talk about our relationship with BARDA, talk about the timeline, the contract, how we're managing um, our VMI or vendor managed inventory, how we will manage uh, an MCI should one occur, and then some other activities that are just part of a contract um, like one with BARDA. Next slide. Uh, disclosure for, from Solvita, we have nothing to disclose. We are a nonprofit tissue bank. We are formally called Community Blood Center Community Tissue Services. So you saw that on Franco's presentation. We have recently rebranded and we're now called Solvita. Um, our blood center was founded in 1964 and our tissue center was founded and started in 1968. We've started processing skin in 1988. So we've been doing this for some time now. We actually have over 1300 total employees and we keep growing. We're a not-for-profit 501c3 and that's something that we are very proud of. 
We have ties to AATB and we're very integrated into the burn community. We are the number one not-for-profit supplier of skin to burn victims. So that was just a little bit about Sylvita. And if you flip this up slide, um, I did want to put this up there, I'll let you read it, but please know the findings and conclusions in my presentation have not been formally disseminated by the Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide, please. I'd like to start with our mission and vision, excuse me. As I mentioned, we rebranded and our name is now Solvita. Solvita comes from soul, meaning sun, and vita, meaning life. And really, it's, it's really our focus on the donor gift and transforming that gift into new hope, bringing light and healing and saving lives for patients around the world. Our mission is to empower people to save and enhance lives. And our vision is to continue providing best in class biologics. Um, we, our real true passion and mission is to honor our donors because without them, we wouldn't be here. Uh, we wanna honor our donors while improving the lives of patients around the world. And I share this with you, not to put words on a screen, but to really express how genuine they are. And if you were walk, to walk into our building here in Kettering, it's a tangible feeling. You'd feel it immediately. Um, it's really great to work for a company like Solvita that has a really meaningful purpose. And thus, I'll touch back to this throughout my presentation here. So we'll move on to the next slide and we'll get into the meat of it. And this is really um, you know, what we do and who we are. So when we talk about recovery and processing, how do we do that? How do we process the quantities that we do to be able to work with BARDA, manage a stockpile and supply skin to burn centers in the US and around the world? And I think the first answer is our culture, as I just explained. It's also our leadership and our team. Our donors are recovered from one of our five branches or one of our 25, and, and that number is growing as well, OPOs or organ procurement organizations. And Franco explained a little bit about this as well. Skin is processed in our Dayton facility, as you can see on the screen there, that's our Dayton facility. And then we store it in our Kettering facility. We have a large distribution room where our skin is stored in deep freezers. Our team processes allografts from split thickness donors and full thickness donors as well. We're not 24 seven, but we're pretty close. We run three shifts Monday through Friday and one 12 hour shift on both Saturdays and Sundays. We have 15 te technicians that process skin and they're very proud to do so. And they do so very respectfully. We have 10 central sterile technicians, making sure that all of the items are sterilized and safe to use. And our technicians process our donors in seven clean rooms and two hoods that are, of course, ISO certified. We produce skin grafts that range from 25 square centimeters to 1800 square centimeters. And we produce grafts that are both non-meshed and meshed one-to-one -one or two-to-one. And we provide so many options and sizes because no burn is the same, no patient is the same. We don't want to just offer large grafts and then they're not, you know, you don't use all of it and they're discarded. We wanna honor the gift. So we try to make sure that we offer that variety for the needs out there in the burn centers. And we have distributed over 21 million square centimeters annually. So that statistic alone really speaks to the value of the skin graft, kind of touches back on that question that was asked, you know, have you thought about using birth tissue? There's many options out there and they all have their time and their place, but the burn skin is the gold standard. It is the gold standard is what surgeons look for and use. Um, it is economically priced and it's tried and true and the results are pr proven. And that, that statistic really uh, solidifies that. And our relationship with BARDA obviously speaks to that as well. So um, we are thrilled to be able to provide that life-saving graft locally, domestically, and internationally. Next slide. So while we're processing the amount of skin that we are, quality is of course, number one. It's our top focus. So our donors are screened first and foremost. Then at the time of recovery, cultures are taken, serology uh, samples are taken and tested. The graphs are then processed 
if passing serology and if they are processed, we collect samples again and do further testing. Then there's a medical uh, review. That's done on site. We have our own um, medical doctors that review charts. And then if, if it's all cleared, there's one more quality check and there's that second quality release. So you can see by that chart on the screen, there's quite a lot of steps. It's not um, a fast process. It's a diligent and thorough process as it should be. And on average, it takes about three months to release a graft, but it can take, if there's an autopsy involved or something in the chart, it can take a year or even over a year. So that's, that's important to know. So we're constantly planning and thinking ahead because the graphs that our team is producing today, we're not gonna be able to, to see for, for several months down the road. Next slide. So piggybacking on production considerations, producing skin allografts is not as simple as other manufacturing processes. And I'm not trying to be flippant. I'm not saying that other manufacturing processes are easy. They're not, I know they're not. I've been in other industries myself, but this is just different. We're dealing with human donors. Each donor must be processed within 96 hours of recovery. And each donor is unique. Our yields that we, um, we get from each donor varies dra drastically. We can have larger donors, smaller donors, tattoos that we have to work around. There might be some stretch marks that we have to work around. So the yields and the sizes that we get vary. And as we're managing our inventory and our demand, that plays a large role. I can't just take a sheet of metal and get 18 widgets. It just doesn't work that way in tissue banking. The donors do produce graphs, but it's that delicate balance of what size of graphs they will produce, what's the market need, and what's the BARDA need as well. Like I mentioned, it takes three plus months for a graph to be released, and that's if it even gets released. Sometimes they're not released. Sometimes they don't pass the serology testings or the medical review. And at that point, the discard we, we discard the graphs, and we do have a high discard rate. That's just part of our process and what we built into to our system. The graphs also must be stored at negative 40 degrees Celsius. So there is cold chain consideration with these allografts. So you can see how it's that delicate balance of managing our inventory, preparing for an emergency, preparing for a large order that we may not have been expecting. You, you, you don't know what's going to happen and when it'll happen, as well as preparing for this BARDA vendor managed inventory. So, so lots of lots of points of consideration in that mix. Next slide, please. So Sylvita so in a crisis situation, um, we do have experience in crisis situations. We also, this is very important, um, we have experience dealing with governments that are foreign and of course domestic to ensure that the skin allographs get distributed according to those local laws and regulations. So you can see in the chart there some examples of how we have engaged in a crisis situation. Um, of course, 9-11, uh, we all remember that. The picture there is of the New Zealand volcanic eruption. Um, I put that one on there because that's the one that sticks in my head the most and I wasn't here in 2019, but it's something that we still talk about today, uh, talk about today with pride. Uh, we had, I know one of my coworkers flew in from Georgia to help pull grass. We had teammates come in who weren't even scheduled to work, come in and pull grass. And that's just circling back to the culture that I explained. We are well-versed in crisis situation and we're an all hands on deck company. If it needs to get done, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and get it done. Uh, we also give donations. We are very, very um, active working with Shriners and of course our military. We work with Brooke Army quite a bit as well. So again, we are well-versed in crisis situations and that is just part of who we are, our culture. Next slide. So I hope everything I've shared with you um, helps you understand why BARDA selected us as one of their uh, two vendors and their primary vendor. So you can see here when BARDA, BARDA issued that RFP in, in 2021, we submitted our proposal. We were awarded our contract in September of 2022. We placed our first allotment of allograft skin into the BARDA VMI, vendor-managed inventory, in January of 2023. 
And we've been placing monthly allocations ever since, and we're doing so now. We have our next one, right, Franco? We have our next one just pending BARDA's approval, and then we'll be we'll be shipping that one off into the VMI as well. So it's a constant cycle and a constant process. Next slide. So BARDA is purchasing existing products, as Franco mentioned, and the storage of these products to pair, prepare for a mass casualty incident where burns may be the majority of the medical consequence. There is a large cost to produce and maintain the quality standards, the amount of skin that is needed, and to have a VMI have the stockpile of the size that BARDA needs based on the research that Franco shared, it could, we could not do it without BARDA's partnership and without BARDA's research and, um, and everything that they bring to the table. It, it would be near impossible. So again, we're really thankful for BARDA's you know, forward thinking and preparation. And we're also happy to accommodate. As part of our contract, we provide a certain amount of skin into the VMI while maintaining our domestic and international demand. Uh, as Franco stated, there's that ramp up and ramp down so we don't cause a burst in a bubble. Um, we do have the skin ready, but we're trying to manage our distribution and maintain that delicate balance that I shared earlier. Storage is a part of it as well, and we are storing the skin across the US at, at secure and confidential locations. BARDA has very specific sizes that they are accepting into their inventory based on the needs in the triage situation. And Franco talked a little bit about the work that they, that they did there, um, determining what the actual need would be. And we're very happy to accommodate that. We keep the BARDA inventory, the US government inventory under the BARDA contract completely separate from our commercial inventory. And that just, that just keep th keeps things easier um, and safe. We provide monthly reports to BARDA. We also label uh, very specifically to allow for complete transparency and complete inventory awareness at any point in time. Um, security, we've mentioned that before, but there's very specific security protocols that are followed due to our commitment to store and manage government skin in case of national uh, emergency. And then there's the rotation aspect. I mean, we could set the skin in the inventory and it can sit there for the five years, but that's not what we wanna do, right? Our mission is to honor the gift. So, and, and BARDA is very cognizant of that fact as well. So we are continually managing and rotating that product to minim minimize the waste from expiry, loss, mishandling. Um, we, we are really making sure we're paying attention to that inventory. Our contract is 10 years, not to exceed 10 years. And like I said, our goal is really just to honor that gift and make sure that skin is utilized before it expires. As part of the contract, there's also a distribution portion. Should there be a mass casualty incident, uh, we do need to be ready 24-7 um, if that happens. And if you flip to the next si slide, as I already shared uh, at Solvita, we, we are ready should BARDA need a partial or a full distribution of their BMI inventory. We have a 24-7 hotline where we're available to be contacted. As I mentioned, the BARDA freezers are separated. We have call trees and communication uh, uh, procedures that are documented and tested, so we, we know that we'll be ready. We have core employees that are on call and standing by, and as mentioned before, I'm sure we'd have extra volunteers just because that's how the culture is here at, at Solvita. Um, and the way that we're storing the BARDA graphs is very strategic. We're storing them in a way that it's quick to ship. It's easy. It's fast. We can get those graphs out the door as instructed by BARDA should it come to that. We also make sure we have sufficient validation, uh, validated shipping containers, dry ice, and other supplies on hand at all of the storage locations. And like I said, we, we've had practice and we're, we are experienced in that immediate response should there, should there be one. Next slide. Last slide, thanks for hanging with me. Uh, just some other activities. Again, as I mentioned, we could not have this quantity of skin without the support of BARDA with all that it entails to manage a VMI. Um, we have quality audits at each location that are very detailed. We have security audits at each location with the very defined protocols. 
We have in-person inspection of the products at each location. Of course, that takes time and travel and costs. We have bi-weekly meetings, uh, Franco and I, and like I mentioned, sometimes more than that, he's a really great partner and I am so thankful for him that he is our core. Um, we have monthly, monthly PCT meetings or project coordination team meetings, and that's just a larger group. Sometimes we invite folks from quality, leadership, same with BARDA, they'll invite different groups um, that might be pertinent for that month at their discretion. And then there's just the ongoing reporting and communication as part of a, a contract and, and good partnership. So um, that's really how we are communicating and working with with BARDA, it's how we're managing the BARDA VMI, as well as ensuring that we're fulfilling the needs domestically and internationally for any burn victim out there. Um, and again, it just wouldn't be able to happen without the support of BARDA and our team here at Salida. So that's it. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. That was um, an excellent compliment to um, Franco's uh, presentation uh, from BARDA. Uh, we have time for a few questions. This is Jed Gorlin as the medical director of a large level one trauma center transition service program. We're highly dependent upon simulations to maintain preparedness. Can you talk about uh, role of simulations to test ability to mobilize stuff. Yeah, so we we've done our our own simulations. We have our SOPs, and we've we've enacted them here internally. And I don't. I'll let. I want to make sure I bring Franco in here because I do not want to speak on behalf of Barda. That's certainly not my place. But I know that we have had conversations and I, I believe that is something that's in the works in a partnership with with BARDA. Franco, did you want to comment as well? Sure. Um, so yeah, part of our contracts with both partners is eventually having a tabletop exercise where we can um, create a scenario and then see how it plays out using um, their systems and our systems and then how that will actually benefit any victims that appear at a, at a burn center for treatment. Thank you. Um, next question to Glenn, Glenn Ramsey. Hi, thanks very much. This is a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, we don't have a burn center here at my center at Northwestern University, so I don't have direct experience with this recently, but um, I was trying to envision how much blood 5,000 patients, burn patients would need as well to tie into our discussions later today. Uh, the, the one publication that I, there's a couple of publications I'm aware of. One is from the Pentagon uh, victims at ni in 9-11, where they, there were 10 patients that used 18 units of red cells each. So you'd scale it up to 5,000 patients, that would be like 90,000 units of blood, uh, not to mention plasma and albumin. I'm just wondering, maybe, but, but perhaps other members of the panel have more I'm sure I have more direct experience with trying to guesstimate how much blood 5,000 patients, burn patients would need. So that's a question for the rest of the group, I guess. Sounds like something we'll have to take up separately, Glenn. Okay, I thought uh, perhaps the, the folks in Dayton might might be supplying both blood and uh, uh, tissue to uh, local burn centers, so they might have some idea of how much that would that would need. Thanks, Scott. Oh yes, thank you. This is I'm Scott Brubaker from uh, Cber FDA. Uh, thank you, Sharon. That was nice. Uh, I, it was a great overview. Uh, you know, my question about amniotic membrane previously was more about access. You know, skin for skin is of course the gold standard. So trying to think of, a, of an event, a, a national emergency event, and it's taken a while now to actually get to the PAR levels and still not at the PAR levels that Bardo wants. If there was a backup tissue type, you could be used for the same thing. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what the rate of donation is. Uh, you, you have a staff that's, you know, there almost 24 seven, like you said, so there must be a constant um, number of donors that 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 do um, 
donate skin and, and you're, you're very active, you're very busy. But if there was another tissue type, you know, from births uh, that happen every day and then probably at a larger rate than, than you have um, deceased donors who donate skin, authorize that consent to it. So that that was my question was was to Franco was really more about that. I know you know um, amniotic membrane is used around the world to treat burns, but not in the U.S. Only because they're not used to that, they're not trained, they're not they're not aware of it. Yeah. Um, so that's you know that's where I was coming from there. So it's just a, that's why I asked if anybody actually even discussed that in any detail. Yeah, and and of course I'm, I'll speak for myself and and not at all for for Barda, but you know in in my discussions with surgeons because we you know we're we're out there we're active, um, it's amnion is really um, I don't want to say bang, bang for your buck. It's a lot more expensive, and the results are really not any better. So that's something I've heard. But I also wanted just to clarify, uh, we do have the total. BARDA allocation now. It's just in our inventory, not in BARDA's yet, because we are doing um, a very strategic uh, monthly allocation so that we can manage that ramp up and ramp down and not cause that bubble burst that, that Franco explained. So if there was an MCI and, and I'm making this up, and, and BARDA was to reach out to us and they needed more that that was in their VMI, we could place extra graphs in their VMI immediately. And if they approved, then those could be distributed as well. So we do have it. It's just in our inventory, not yet Barda's inventory. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Scott, one other addition where I think your head was going to is that it would be nice if skin didn't have to be a frozen product. Yeah. Frozen is very difficult to, yeah. I mean, we have, I, I can't tell you how many, I work with Sharon, so we, how many freezers we have just dedicated to BARDA and the amount of, you know, dry ice it takes then to ship things out in boxes and things like that. If there was a freeze dried product that could be used, especially like an Amnion or something would be good. Um, a usual skin donor though can yield three to four square feet of skin, sometimes more depending on how it's recovered, where an amnion donor would be yeah. a lot more individual processing of donor. But again, more numbers may be potential because they're living donors. A little difference there. That's a good point. Very nice, Sharon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to everyone for your questions. Thanks to um, Sharon and Franco for the presentations. We now have a break coming up. We have one extra minute um, that we can grant. So we will begin again at 10 minutes after the hour, just six minutes from now, or five minutes from now now. Okay, thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.